Hey, this is my eSports series, and this time I'm going to be talking about the GSL Finals uh, Season 3 of 2018, the one between Maru and TY. And I thought this was a very interesting sort of finals. Not only was it close, it was pretty back and forth. There was a few epic games in there. But what I really wanted to talk about was um, the what I think might have been the deci decisive edge. Because, and in order to understand that, I guess we'll have to go a little bit back into the histories of both Maru and TY. And what is it about them as players? So Maru is a player who's literally been playing StarCraft II since in inception. He was in the first GSL Open Season 1 in 2010. And here we are basically eight years later. TY, on the other hand, started his... Um, career in Brood War and then he transferred over with Kespa and I'd argue his StarCraft 2 career has probably been more successful than his Brood War career even though he was pretty hyped up in Brood War but not necessarily among the best players in that game at least from what I saw from his record what I saw from his Brood War games right and so this the difference between when Maru starts StarCraft 2 and when TY starts StarCraft 2 is generally the uh I'd say it would be the three years of Wings of Liberty that's the difference. And Kespa um, transfers over at the very end of Wings of Liberty into Heart of the Swarm. So there isn't a lot of time for uh, TY specifically to practice that particular game. And this becomes kind of an important issue now, five years later, which is why I'm doing this video. It's because the amount of people who would both who 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 would, who would have seen the, those games in Wings of Liberty and seen these games now and would have been able to make this connection are very minimal as far as I can tell nobody has made this connection so and I don't even know if it's necessarily correct it's just something I noticed and I thought was very interesting when we we're talking about this specific matchup between Maru and TY and so that's their general histories Maru himself he spends about three years in like the hyperbolic time chamber of prime before he becomes legitimately like the legitimately a top tier player in 2013 in the osl run and in that osl run like nobody was expecting much from him i remember like uh in control saying something like uh he really shouldn't have won that uh osl group against a bunch of like the korean kespa guys and even though it sounds disrespectful, kind of, it, he was probably correct in the sense that he was a complete underdog. He hadn't really done much throughout most of his Wings of Liberty career. Not only that, but he was on Prime, which was like a terrible organization, whereas all these Kespa guys were super tryhard. It was a new game. There were a lot of various reasons as to why that happened. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is Maru rises up during that time, beats Rain in the finals of that OSL, and from that period to the end, I'd say... Um, to almost the end of Heart of the Swarm, he's basically a top three Terran or the best Terran, depending on which time period you're talking about. It's between him, Tasia, Innovation, generally speaking, and then like one or two people, maybe they jump into that category, depending on what time you're talking about. Flash, TY, uh, actually no, not TY was never able to jump out of the category. I meant Flash, Dream, maybe Kier, if you really want to talk about that like one week. Uh, it's kind of iffy, right? Um, uh, Pult maybe ish. Uh, yeah, but generally, generally, just like Tej generally, would just be those three main three guys. Tasia, I talked about Tasia, Innovation, Maru. Now, what made Maru such a great player during that time? It's actually what makes him such a great player now. Very aggressive, cr aggressive and creative. Uh, somebody with incredible mechanical skill. I'd argue he's mechanically better back then than he is now though it might really just be down to the difference in games because wing of the liberties was different from heart of the swarm which is different from legacy of the void i actually do think um in terms of the mid game heart of the swarm was probably the expansion most suited to maru's abilities as a player as a macro player and a fighting player so to say and he was the, he, and even though I consider him a very aggressive player who generally wins the early game, mid game, or early, uh, early late, late early game, so to say, 
He was also one of those players who did dabble a bunch in end game and late game scenarios. And he does this uh, usually in pro league when he w- once he eventually joined Janair or uh, in a few a few odd matches every once in a while. Like in his uh, GSL finals against Rain, one of the reasons he actually cracks Rain is because he forces Rain to respect his uh, late game. And because Rain is forced to respect his late game, he uh, gets caught off guard when Maru does the proxy two racks. All right, so if Maru didn't actually have a good late game, he probably wouldn't have beaten Rain to win his first uh, and only OSL title. So that's the kind of player Maru was. Now you get into Legacy of the Void, and specifically this year, because this year Maru has evolved to a new level of play. And I have very different opinions from other people. So basically, here's what how I think what here's what I think happened. Right, Maru has always been a very smart player, uh, but smart in a different sense. As in, he doesn't necessarily understand the normal standards of play. He doesn't necessarily understand the uh, the way the other players are thinking. But he does understand himself. He does understand his own skills, and he understands how to make use of those skills. So when you look at a bunch of his hardest sword games, especially in pro league, but it's uh, you can you can view it in the rest of his games, like in early Wings of Liberty. I mean, not Wings of Liberty, early Heart of the Swarm, for instance. He was literally the first guy to do Marine Marauder medevac mine pushes and make them work before the mine was buffed. And what I mean by that it was like it was like half half or like a third of the strength it is today. And he was making that work against Protoss players. He was making that work against Zerg players. He was a very he was a very very good player. And a very creative player because he's also like one of the first guys to do a bunch of different types of early, early game, early game openings. He, he was he also was one of the first players to do a very aggressive uh, mech style. In that sense, he was kind of similar to like Ty or Fantasy, but he didn't use it quite as much. But he could also transition towards a late game. But the late game part would be like he'd only use that like five percent of his games, and that's the difference between old Maru, which I'll delineate as. Wings of the Liberty Maru or Heart of the Swarm Maru to current modern day Maru, which is Legacy of the Void Maru in 2018. Because this year, for whatever reason, he made a breakthrough. And I don't know what exactly it is. I can only tell you what I saw in the game. So basically, when we're talking about like that Raven, uh, we're talking about like the Raven Ghost shit that he basically used to destroy all of Zerg in the earlier parts of 2018, uh, specifically against Dark. And. Basically, Maru c- comes up with this com- combination. It's very similar to... Strategically, it's very similar to what MVP did in Early Wings of Liberty. But the uh, units are all very different. And the builds and how you get there are completely radically different. So if, if you want, you can say it's a completely different... It's like an execution of an old idea. But in a completely different way, in a completely different game. So I, I'll go ahead and say I doubt he actually took any kind of inspiration from MVP probably just did it on his own and just happens to like follow along the same strategic guidelines of that idea or that thought and basically the guidelines is like you create this ultimate energy based army that always that always has superior value that will always win the team fight um the um big fu- the late, late game fight in that sense like Starcraft 2's like the idea of, like the death ball versus death ball that's kind of how it was defined earlier on earlier on and throughout most of its like history like if you can win that you you'll win you'll win the game no matter what generally speaking right and so that's basically what maru does if i get to the end game then i can beat everybody and he proves this and he does this against dark who is arguably the best late game player zerg has ever seen um there's some caveats to that because like i'm a person who does like go through the expansion to say and each expansion and each patch has very different win conditions as to what it means to be a great late game player but at least in legacy of the void i'll go ahead and say i think dark's the best late game player of anybody until maru this year and maru beats him and this is a critical like uh strategic point for maru and that that and you're probably asking yourself why did this, what the fuck does this have to do with the maru versus ty games and I'm getting there but basically when you consider um, Starcraft 2 players 
it's not necessarily talked about, but it is sort of implied in that the play style, the play styles of a particular player carries over from matchup to matchup to matchup, regardless of the fact that you're literally playing different races. So for instance, Snoot is probably one of the best examples where he was a very late game oriented player for a majority of his career until like the end of like uh, Heart of the Swarm where they like nerfed him like a third time or something. Uh, they being Blizzard, right? And so he was the player who always focused on the late game in all three of his matchups, even though like there were times where it didn't necessarily make sense for him to do so. All right. And you look at somebody like Polt, and Polt does did something very similar where he's like, okay, I will lose the early game, I'll lose the mid game, because mechanically speaking, I'm actually inferior to a bunch of these players, but I will opposition them in the late game. I will force a uh, constant base trades. I will play I, I will play the map rather than play the battle. And that's how Polt was getting his value out of the game. That's how he was winning his titles, his series against arguably much better players a bunch of times. And, and almost at, by the end of like I'd say by like mid twenty thirteen, almost every like good player was was like getting huge was getting pretty good leads on Polt, but Polt was constantly making comebacks against them because he understood the game better and it didn't really matter what race you're talking about. He did this against Zerg, Protoss, and Terran. So that's what I mean by your playstyle can transcend matchups. And so now we get into Maru versus TY, and I guess I'll we'll go from TY's perspective. What is it about TY that makes him a great player? TY is was born in Pro League. That's how I describe it. And if you understand Pro League, or if you don't, I'll explain it now. Pro League was a team league of StarCraft uh, originated in Brood War, and it was 1v1, and then each, each team would send out X amount of players, and then they would play on one specific map with one specific build. And because you did that, you can easily create counter builds or or snipe certain players with very specific matchups. And TY was born into this league because that's literally how you grew up in the Kespa system. You started off as a practice partner. Then when you got good enough, you were risen you they raised you up to the pro league level. And then when you good enough there you went to the individual league. And of course the highest honors would be the guy would be the guy who could do both. Right? And so in TY's case that's where you was born and bred and that's basically defined his entire career because this is a guy who like Maru very creative but very creative very smart he has constantly throughout the years created a multitude of different types of openings different types of gambits all of them revolve around the early game or mid game and cracking open the other player through pressure through multi-pronged attacks through maneuvers I would call like cute annoying frustrating they're just they're they're there to positionally pull you apart and put TY in a great lead and then help him win the game or sometimes if you sometimes if the other opponent wasn't good enough he would just kill them but Maru was different Maru he could do that kind of style but his style is more of I'll do this early I'll do this creative early game thing but it's going to kill you that's the difference between Mario and TY where TY was more like oh I'll position you I'll get advantages then I'll win the I'll, I'll win a little bit later on or or a bit a bit further into the future Maru is a player who literally could just fucking kill you over and over and over again so uh they're very similar players but they have very they but they've they went apro- across a slightly different paths and so when you these two people collide actually what's going to happen is I think it's going to be a straight up 50-50 draw and this is actually what we see in West Egg 2016 when the two of them do play in a best of seven finals and it goes 4-3 in TY's favor and basically they just they just swing back and forth between aggressive ag- aggression versus aggression and who comes out in terms of of build orders in terms of execution in terms of aggression uh, mind games all that generally wins the, that series so TY won that 4-3 and so you go into this GSL finals. This is actually the one that the only one that could have legitimately threatened Maru because uh, I don't think either of the other ones, season one or season two, uh, either of those finalists he played in those two 
and those two GSLs actually had a le legit chance of upsetting Maru in a best of seven. TY does here because of the play style matchup inherent in both players. And so basically for a majority of these games we're talking about in this GSL finals, that's kind of what happens is the, the aggression between the two players, like like they, they switch, they switch up and then they kind of just blow, blow each other apart. The only game, and this is where the three years of experience comes in for Maru. The only game that does go to the end game, does go to the late game, was, I believe, on Lost and Found, the fourth game in the set. In the, in the set. And this is the one with the Battle cruiser, Cruisers, the Ravens, the Vikings. And this is something that Maru would have actual experience with, in a sense, relative to TY. And he would also have the strategic... And he also has a strategic wherewithal to play that kind of style. So what do I mean by that? Basically, when we look at TVT, the evolution of TVT from Wings of Liberty to Heart of the Swarm to now, it has effectively changed throughout each expansion. So winning a TVT in the modern day is very different from winning a TVT in Wings of Liberty. Even if you legitimately like time traveled some fool back in time to play Wings of Liberty TVT, there's no guarantee that Terran player would actually win because the strengths and skills demanded of that of those players was very different from the strengths and skills demanded of these players. Assuming, of course, like, like well, basically that's that's what I mean. So, basically, yeah, yeah, we'll just keep moving ahead because like I don't want to go into the whole time travel thing. It's very complicated, but basically, Wings of Liberty TBT. I'll explain that. This, from 2011 to uh, 20, to most, uh, um, I'd say about halfway into 2012. This is, this is like the peak of what people try to refer to as the GOM TVT era. And this is an era that TY will have zero experience with because he was still playing Brood War at the time. The Kessel players don't transfer until the end of 2012. And even then, by the time they transfer, it is peak Brood Lord Infest era. So the chances of them legitimately playing very good high level TBTs, non existent. And so, what, what happens during these TBTs? What happens is a bunch of these games end up going into end game, end game scenarios. And End game scenarios are different from late game. Late game is like you get, you get your all your bases, you get your ultimate army, relatively speaking, and then you go to your ultimate army and you're fighting it out, and then whoever loses the clash or whoever like makes the better moves on the map ends up winning that, right? In the end game scenario, it's split map, as in you've already gone through that entire thing, and both of you are so good you can't kill each other. So what happens in this scenario is very different from what happens in. Uh, late game scenario and what delineates late game from end game is very different like it's not time because innovation and tasia played for like an hour in uh, on newkirk and they technically split the map but they never actually went into end game because of the amount of aggression and moves they constantly made to attack each other they never actually hit, hit end game of that tvt despite that being one of the long one of the longer tvts Endgame is when you legitimately cannot attack the other person. And what do you do in this scenario? This is the puzzle. This is the this is a very specific puzzle limited to TVT in Wings of Liberty, in a sense, in that they happen the most in Wings of Liberty relative to Heart of the Swarm, where you get the Menevac boost, and relative to Legacy of the Void, where there's a bunch of different ways you can die. Right? And a bunch of different aggressions, because aggression has obviously been raised to a higher level so you're you if you're if you have more aggressive powerful units the other guy's just going to die sometimes that's just how it goes so what happened in those games well the evolution of that tbt is um generally speaking there were a few people who tried it out beyond famously was one of them where he tried to do mule uh mule mining on the other opponent's enemy side so he would like in a split map scenario where you split it 50-50 with a bunch of tanks and turrets and whatnot, he would scan the other opponent's base and then try it and then land his mules on their base to steal their minerals, right? So that was one way to do it. MVP was the most famous because right? he basically made like a tactical like genius move against Top that literally broke Top's career. But basically, what I want to focus on is the idea of economy, the idea of mules, and the idea of scans.
And this is something Tasia was a fucking master with that no Terran actually imitated until like three, four years later. I'm pretty sure that's the timeline we're talking about. But to be fair to most of these Terrans I'm talking about, a lot of them didn't play in these endgame scenarios. So maybe they would have played like Tasia. It's just they never got there because for whatever reason their games didn't go that way. Or I maybe I didn't see them. Or maybe they, they matchups were like a shit ton of Zerg, shit ton of Protoss. Like that happens a bunch too. Like there are various reasons as to why this happened this way. But basically when you play in endgame scenarios as you see in... You can go ahead and watch uh, the game four of Lost and Found between Maru and T.Y. What happens here is you get to this endgame scenario and one of the first things people teach you is, oh, when you get to the endgame scenario, you want to sacrifice your SCVs because you get the Mule Hammer and then, and then so you sacrifice your SCVs, you get, you get a few extra units. Now, what does T.Y. do here? T.Y. actually does sacrifice more SCVs relative to Maru. If you want to just look at the look back at the VOD, I think he sacrifices like 10 more than Maru. And this is actually a terrible, terrible idea. And this isn't... And the reason it's a terrible, terrible idea is because he isn't legitimately thinking of the balance between army, economy, mules, and... Army, economy, and scans. Sorry. Because he is legitimately hit... TY, that is is legitimately hitting the first step of the evolution of knowledge of endgame TVT, where he's thinking in his mind, oh, if I get rid of this SEVs, I can I can just I can just make up for that with mules to get the same minerals and I'll have a larger army. But the actual evolution of that thought is what Teja does, which is you keep six you keep sixty to seventy SEVs, but you don't use your energy on Mules, you use them on scans. And scans are far more important at the endgame scenario, especially if you have a death ball army. And this is what both players have in this game. Battlecruisers, Vikings, Ravens. This is a death ball army. One one shot, everything dies. Basically. Or everything can fucking die. Like one shot in, in, in a straight up battle. So what is more... So the most important thing in this particular game, in the endgame scenario wasn't having a larger army by a little bit. It was having the positional knowledge. And to get positional knowledge, you need the SAVs. And the reason you need the SAVs is because you can't waste your energy on scans. And that's kind of why I think those three extra years Maru spent playing Wings of Liberty is why he beat TY in that particular game. Though, to be fair, it's the other reason I think is because of the evolution in Maru's thought and strategic thought in this particular year where he he was very focused on the end game late game scenarios especially in the Ter- Terran versus Zerg matchup but as I said the way you play one matchup can have an effect on the way you play other matchups and how you, how you view them and that's always been a part of T- of Maru Maru's idea so basically what I'm saying is Maru won because he was smarter and the reason he was smarter is because he had more experience because of those three extra years of wall TVT and that might have been the decisive moment for me as to why Maru won this uh, GSL. All right, I'll see you guys later.